but just hang on to 20, uh, we'll spend a lot of time in Matthew 19, 20 this morning. Uh, just before I start, I, I'd like to give the Macquarie Lectureship a plug uh, again. Um, it starts Wednesday evening and continues through until uh, Sunday. And this is one of the big events that we have uh, where Christians come from all over the place, not only from different parts of Australia, but overseas as well. And um, it's an opportunity to hear uh, various people. Um, and um, we have people like Dale Hartman, who comes out every year from the US and so forth. Uh, it'd be great if you could take time to go over there. Uh, I know during the week uh, many people are busy with work and so forth, but on, it will be on, on Saturday afternoon. Uh, there is a timetable up there on the notice board, and Brian's got some extra uh, copies as well. And also on Sunday, from here to there is only about half an hour. Um, you just, just go through uh, roads and um, uh, Meadowbank and Top Ride and you're there. Uh, so I encourage you uh, to seriously think about that. Uh, just to give it a personal side, over the years it's disappointed me so often to see Christians in different congregations who don't come year after year after year. Um, it does, it's just such an opportunity to hear others and to meet others as well. And I know sometimes people say, well, I don't really know anybody over there. <laughs> You've got to meet people to get to know them. And it is a good atmosphere. It's a good positive atmosphere. People are very friendly. And so, again, I'd encourage you, if you can, to, to make some time and to be part of that. In regard to today's lesson, I'd like to start with the words of a song. We are the citizens of the planet. We were born here. We're going to die here, come what may. We are entitled by our birth to the treasures of the earth. No one must be denied these. No one must be denied. Those words come from a Simon Garfunkel song uh, called Citizen of the Planet. And what I particularly want to focus on there are the lines, uh, we are entitled by our birth to the treasures of the earth. And there's that word entitled. Now, in this context, the word entitled um, is used in a, an unselfish context. The idea is that all should be able to share in the earth's resources. And, uh, we should not... Uh, keep anybody away from what the earth can provide because God's put it all here. But the word entitled also has a selfish application where we talk about what I am entitled to. Um, the idea is that uh, I'm entitled to something, I have the right to something because of who I am or because of what I have done. And there, as I say, the idea is one of selfishness. But when we try to apply that to salvation, and the idea that we personally, because of who we are and what we've done, are entitled to salvation, then we have got it very wrong. And this is the point that Jesus is making in Matthew chapter 20, and indeed is making it in Matthew 19 as well. Let me just read to you two verses here. The first one is Matthew 19 and verse 30. This is Jesus speaking. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And then in Matthew 20 and verse 16, again Jesus speaking, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. So there is if you like, the theme running through this. The last shall be first, the first shall be last. You'll also notice here that Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1 begins with the word 
before. And when you see that, it's linking what is about to be said with what has just been said. So for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner that is linked by the word for to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19. And so really we've got to look broader afield than just Matthew chapter 20 to get an understanding here. And in fact, uh, if we go back to Matthew uh, 19 and verse 30, well, all of the section leading up to that comes out of what Jesus said earlier. And, and so, in effect, you've got a whole section here from Matthew 19 and verse 16 right through to Matthew 20 and verse 16, all of which is dealing with the same basic idea. So we'll start with Matthew 19 verses 16 through to 26. A wealthy young man comes to Jesus and asks a question. Verse 16, someone came to him, to Jesus, and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do so that I may obtain eternal life? And Jesus gives him an answer. He will keep the commandments. And we understand that uh, right up to through the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, Israel was still under the Old Testament law. And so Jesus was telling this man to keep the Old Testament commandments. And the young man replies uh, in verse 20, I've done that. I've been following the commandment. And Jesus takes him at his word. He doesn't argue with him. The young man asks a further question. What am I still lacking? And Jesus goes on and replies to that in verse 21. If you want to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. So, do you have to give up everything to be a follower of Jesus? Well, in a way, yes. But there's something here that particularly applies to this young man. We know from other examples in the Gospels that Jesus knew individuals. He knew what their thoughts were. He knew what their attitudes were. He knew what their backgrounds were. And so Jesus here gives a response that particularly applies to this wealthy young man. And he's putting a challenge to this young man. If you like, he's testing the young man to say, okay, where do your priorities lie? And the young man, by his following actions, gives the answer. Verse 22, but when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. What came first? His work. He very much wanted salvation because what Jesus had asked caused him to grieve. But at the same time, he found it right there and then impossible to give up what he had and to follow Jesus. And so he had wealth to the degree that wealth was his priority. That was what came number one in his life and he wasn't able to give that up. So he walks away. And Jesus then beginning in verse 23 talks to his disciples and he makes the point that the wealthy were going to find it <laughs> difficult to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not that God is prejudiced against the wealthy. God wants all to be saved. But the problem with wealth is that you can become attached to your wealth. And that becomes the priority in your life. And like the rich young man, you're unable to put that second or third or whatever and put Jesus first. 
So, does that mean then that God just allows certain people to be lost? How did God react to that young man walking away? Well, Jesus says, yes, it's hard. And the disciples respond in verse 25 saying, well, then who can be saved? Well, Jesus responds in verse 26, with people this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So God can save. God doesn't reject anybody. And God can help people to make a response if they are willing to commit themselves to him. But the point here in this section, verses 16 through to 26, is that wealth might entitle you to certain things, certain privileges within society, but it doesn't entitle you to heaven. It doesn't entitle a, purpose, a person to salvation. Salvation comes from God. And he's the one that we need to look to rather than our bank account or our social standing. So then we go on to verses 27 to 30 in chapter 19. And having been told by Jesus how difficult it was for the rich to put God and Christ and salvation first, and having themselves seen a demonstration of it by the young man walking away, Peter then draws the issue back to the apostles. Verse 27, Peter responded and said to him, to Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? They had done what the young man was unwilling to to do. They had given up their jobs, uh, they had given up their possessions, uh, they had given up their homes to follow Jesus. They would follow him up and down the country uh, during the three years or so of his ministry. <coughs> well, Jesus indicated to them that they would be blessed. Uh, he indicates that they themselves personally would be blessed. And then he says, anybody who follows me will be blessed. You look at verses 28 and 29, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration or the renewal, you could say, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then notice verse 29, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms on account of my name will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. Now that's not teaching that we'll all become instant millionaires and we'll all have a great deal of property and all of that sort of thing. I have talked about verse 29 in previous lessons. It's the idea that because we are all family in church, in the church, we share together. And it's as though we've got a much greater family. Many mothers, many fathers. In other words, older Christians who advise us and help us and so forth. Many houses in that through Christian hospitality, we welcome into homes all over the place. That's the idea here of being blessed. So... Uh, with those who are willing to give up material things and give the priority to Jesus, there is great blessing. And so that leads to Jesus' statement in Matthew 19 and verse 30, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. In the context Matthew 19 verses 16 to 30 that statement appears to me that those who consider themselves to be in a position of privilege and entitlement weren't they weren't in a position of privilege and entitlement 
Now they might be considered the foremost people in society as the wealthy often are. But the poor and the needy have greater opportunity for salvation, not because God is biased against the rich towards the poor, not because God is some sort of socialist, but rather because it is often the poor and the needy rather than the rich and the powerful who see their need for God and are willing to turn to God. You'll notice all through here that it's not just a question of wealth, whether you cling to it or give it up. There is something else in all of this. Uh, in fact, in Matthew 19 and verse 21, Jesus says to the young man, at the end there, you need to follow me. And then uh, it says here in verse uh, 26 uh, that salvation is possible through God. And then in verse 27, Peter says, we have left everything and follow you. And then in verse 28, Jesus says, truly I say to you that you who have followed me and then in verse um, 29, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms on account of my name, you see again and again and again, it's not just the matter of your attitude to wealth, but it is who comes first and particularly that needs to be God and Jesus Christ because that is who uh, salvation comes through. So those who might have great wealth and great social status and might be considered first in society are not first when it comes to salvation, when it comes to a relationship with God. And so then Jesus leads on into chapter 20 and verse 1 with the word for the kingdom of God is like a landowner. He enters into a parable, and the parable goes from chapter 20, verse 1, down to chapter 20, verse 15. That parable, by the word for at the beginning, is a follow-on from Matthew 19 and verse 30. You could say it's an explanation of Matthew 19 and verse 30. And in the parable, a landowner goes out to seek workers. Early in the morning, he goes out and he discusses a rate with them. The rate is a denarius for a day's work. They agree to that, and so they're employed. These are casual workers. They're not permanent workers. They're not on a salary or a fixed wage. They are people who day by day would have to seek work. And that method uh, probably still exists in some places. I know here in Australia, for instance, down at the docks in Sydney years ago, every morning you'd have to turn up at the docks hoping that you would get some work for that day. That's the way it was with these men. So they would wait there hoping for somebody to come and employ them for the day. And that is what the, uh, the landowner does. So he gets some people first thing in the morning. Then it says in verse, three, oh, incidentally, a denarius, uh, according to encyclopedias and so forth, uh, is the, or was, the basic Roman coin, and it is considered to have been the standard daily rate of pay for a labourer. So they agree to that. They, they go to work. And then in verse 3, G, uh, Jesus says the landowner goes out about the third hour. Now what they would do is measure the day from sunrise to sunset, but divided into 12. So if we say that sunrise is about 6 a.m., the third hour would be about 9 a.m. So Jesus, go, uh, not Jesus, the landowner goes out, hires some more people at 9 a.m., and uh, agrees to them to pay and with them to pay the right price. Then in verse five, he goes out about the sixth hour, which would be around midday, the ninth hour, which would be about 3 p.m. And then he also goes out about uh, the 11th hour in verse six, which would be about 5 p.m. And I then for the rest of the day, which 
that would be just an hour's work. And then it comes time to pay, but you got paid at the end of the day. But in keeping with the parable to make a point, Jesus says that the, the ones who are the last to be hired are the first to be paid. And they get a denarius. They're happy with that. And also, the people who are employed first thing in the morning are probably thinking, hey, this is great. They got a denarius for just an hour's work or so. Boy, we're probably going to do really well today. And then when it comes their turn, what do they pay? They're paid a denarius too. They all get the same amount. And the ones who were employed at the beginning of the day are not happy with that. They're resentful. But the landowner says, well, I, I haven't done anything wrong here. If you look at the beginning in chapter 20, and verse 13, he answered, the landowner answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? And that's what they've done. He talked to them in the morning. They agreed that denarius was a fair day's pay. They accepted that. So verse 14, the landowner says to them, Take what is yours and go. But I want to give to this uh, but I want to give to this last person the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I want with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? There's no issue here of illegality. Those people who were employed first thing in the morning agreed to a denarius and at the end of the day, the landowner paid them a denarius. They got the rate that they were agreed to. The landowner didn't underpay them. <laughs> Rather than underpaying the early workers, the landowner showed generosity to the later workers. Now, you know, if that was today, uh, and we were the early ones employed, we'd be off to the union. <laughs> Except that they're casual, so they're probably not in the union. I used to be a wage, I used to uh, be the pay mark, if you like, with the Department of Agriculture, and I've dealt with some of these issues here. Um, we today have standardised uh, wage agreements. That was part of my job in the past. I would have to read through the Government Gazette looking for all the relevant uh, um, uh, wages awards uh, for the different industries that were within the Department of Agriculture, and then I'd have to apply that and uh, adjust the wages accordingly. But you don't have that here. You don't have standardised wage agreements. It's paid what you thought was agreeable and what people accepted. You've got to remember in all of this, Jesus is teaching a parable. He's not writing a discourse on wage rates in first century Israel. Right? This isn't an analysis of wage agreements and so forth. This is a parable. It's a story based upon life illustrating a principle. And what Jesus is illustrating is the principle that's already been raised in Matthew chapter 19, particularly verse 30, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Now I've made the point that chapter 19 and chapter 20 are interconnected. Chapter 20, well, in both chapters you've got the statement that the last shall be first, the first shall be last. Chapter 20 verse 1 begins with the word for, which connects chapter 20 back to, uh, to chapter 19, and you can work your way back through chapter 9 until you come to chapter 19, sorry, you can work through chapter 19 until you come back to verse 16. That's where this whole conversation begins. So you understand Matthew 20 in the light of Matthew chapter 19. And the point to take from Matthew 19 is that people can't, claim to be entitled to heaven on the basis of who they are 
or what they have. In other words, their material wealth. They have no claim on heaven on that basis. This is further demonstrated in Matthew chapter 20. Sorry, it's further demonstrated at the end of chapter 19 where Jesus says it's the apostles who have given everything up for Jesus who, could I say, have a claim on heaven? That, that doesn't seem right. We could say it is they who will receive God's blessings because God is the giver and they have committed themselves to Christ. Remember again in Matthew 19 how often this idea of God and Christ comes into it. So it's not just about how much wealth you have or you don't have. It's whether you're willing to put God and Jesus Christ first. So going on into Matthew chapter 20, Jesus again in this parable shows us that salvation is not based upon personal entitlements. In Matthew chapter 19, people are not entitled to salvation and blessings just because they are rich. And in chapter 20, people are not entitled to salvation and blessings simply on the basis of how much work they've done. Salvation, we read back in Matthew 19 and verse 26, depends upon God. And really on that basis, when we look at the parable in Matthew 20, who is the landowner? It is God. God takes people on and God pays them. Let me rephrase that. In the parable, the landowner takes people on and the landowner pays them. It's all about God. It's about the landowner who represents God. I'll get it right in a moment. That's what I'm trying to say here. These people needed work. They weren't going to get work just standing there either. And if they didn't have work, they didn't have an income. And if they didn't have an income, they didn't have food. So they depended upon somebody coming along who could offer them work and pay them for it. And that's our situation in regard to spiritual matters. That we cannot save ourselves. We are dependent upon God to save us through Jesus Christ. So just as these casual laborers were looking for an employer, so we need a saviour. We need God and we need Jesus Christ. How much money you've got, how much work you've done, that is not the basis of salvation. And just as the landowner paid the same to all, so it is that God gives salvation to all who turn to him. And you're not advantaged or disadvantaged by when you became a Christian. You might be Christian for 50 years or more. You might be a Christian for 10 years. But it's God's grace that is the issue and all will receive salvation. Now that doesn't mean that, oh well, then let's put it off and put it off until we turn to God because you don't know how much time you have you need God as much as possible you need to turn to him when you can so here is the theme thing that everything depends upon God not upon you there's a, there's a passage <clears throat> in Luke 13 and not um, I was going to say, I know I'm going over time. Actually, I'm going to start with lunch. No preacher ever goes over time. Preacher is sometimes prevented from starting on time. But look here, in, in Luke 13, uh, beginning in about verse 25, Jesus again is using the illustration. He talks about the head of the house closing the door, and therefore 
those who aren't inside the house being shut out. And these people in here in this illustration cry out, uh, open up to us. And uh, they say in verse 26, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. What do they claim? They're claiming privilege here. You know, we, we were locals with you. We're entitled to enter in. And here the, the house owner says to them, uh, I do not know where you are from. Leave me. And again, you've got the statement in Luke 13 and verse 30. Some are last who will be first and some who are first will be last. So this idea comes up again and again and again. Salvation is not about you. It's not about who you are. It's not about the size of your house. It's not about the amount of money in your bank account. It's not about the color of your skin. It's not about the nation in which you were born. It's not about your position in some company. It's not about who, how much you've done. It's not even about how religious you are because Jesus made the point back in Matthew chapter 7 that some would say, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not do that? Did we not do something else? And what will be said to them? Depart, I never knew you. Should we be religious? Better, should we be spiritual people? Yes, we should. But we are not saved on the basis of talent or of you know being workaholics or anything like that. Again and again and again it comes back to God and Jesus Christ and the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God. And so none of us can sit back and say, well, I'm special. I'm okay. I deserve heaven. You can't say that. And equally, you can't say, well, I'm not special, so I guess I don't deserve heaven. You can't say that either. Because whoever you are, you need the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And thankfully, we have a God who loves us and wants our salvation and will richly supply that grace through Jesus Christ to all who turn to him. As I say, God doesn't look at your bank account. God doesn't look at your property portfolio. God says what to do. Believe. Put your faith in God and in Christ. Repent, turn away from a life of sin. Confess your belief in Christ. Be baptized into Jesus Christ and then walk with God through Jesus Christ. And God, by his grace, gives salvation. So don't think that you're not good enough because you lack any special qualities. Or don't think you are good enough because you've got certain qualities and are therefore entitled. No. The message is God saves through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's where we need to look. It's who we need to depend upon. And if you do turn to God through Jesus Christ, you have the assurance of God's blessings. So let's stand and sing.